Mr. Martin Day is the lab learning expert at Extreme Labs. He has worked in the software engineering industry for more than 25 years, most recently focusing on applying virtualization technologies to interactive learning solutions. Before Extreme Labs, Martin worked at Microsoft for 17 years, initially as development manager of the systems management server SMS product and later as director of product management for the Microsoft System Center suite of systems management products. As a reminder to all of our attendees, this conference is being recorded. We will have question and answer at the end of the presentation. Please use the question and answer tool if you have a question for the speaker. The stage is all yours, Martin. You can now share your content and unmute yourself. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sana. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good day to you all. Uh, uh, my name is Martin Day, and it's now a pleasure now to talk to you about some performance-based testing. Uh, as you heard in that roundup, uh, I have worked in Microsoft for many years and, and in various other companies involved in IT training. And uh, I would say that we've probably been working in labs specifically, hands-on lab development and design for about 20 years, just over 20 years. Today, though, I'm going to talk about a very specific aspect of that training, uh, and that's performance-based testing. Uh, it's an area that has excited me for many years, uh, the ability to use hands-on lab environments, simulated environments, in a way that instruments a student's work, in a way to measure student development and student progress. I've always found that to be an attractive area to work because it provides so much more value uh, to both the student and to the client who develops the learning content in the first place. And hopefully today we can have a quick look at some of the ways that this solution can be used to enhance the learning experience and also to provide a tool to generate better content going forward. So first of all, uh, a quick look at a lab maturity model. This is, uh, shows really how lab technology has evolved over the last 20 odd years. I mean, 20 years ago, when we were building hands-on lab training solutions, we were relying largely on tools like Ghost and imaging solutions that really provided just a sandbox, an area, a space, a safe environment in which students could work. We've come a long way from there, and I'm not going to dwell upon all of the different points along that path. But in my view, the key parts are that assessment has become a recent focus. The ability to measure the work that students do, to monitor the work students do, and indeed to use that measurement process to examine students and provide high stakes certifications. This to me is, is the pinnacle of hands on lab solution development. And it's certainly something that I've been focusing on for the last eight years and evolving this technology to provide a number of different solutions. And we're now going to take a look at some of those. I see the PBT assessment scenarios and solutions as being somewhat of a spectrum. Um, at one end of that spectrum are what I describe as high stakes scenarios. These tend to be lab environments in which the student has some level of uh, commitment. There's going to be a measurement that will count towards their future career, their profession. So there's obviously a, a high level of commitment to getting the scores right. And indeed, in all of the scenarios and solutions you see here, uh, they tend to be highly moderated, highly tested, because they have to be very consistent. We have to ensure that we provide a measurement process in a hands-on lab environment that is consistent across all students and provides the same level of result in a dependable and reliable way. The obvious examples here would be certification exams. Increasingly, uh, various vendors, including Microsoft and VMware, are using hands-on labs as a, as a performance-based testament solution for certification. More and more courses are being migrated away from simple multiple choice exams and scenarios to a hands-on solution, which actually tests a student's ability to do the work, to complete the, and use the skills that they've learned during their training, and not simply to answer questions about them. But the same solution that's needed for these uh, certification exams, these hands-on exams, 
which needs also to be applied to the practice exams. Uh, it, it, it's just as important that the students be able to prepare and to verify their skills before they go forward to a certification exam. Various other exam scenarios, such as academic semester exams, are also part of that, that uh, skill set and result set. But the same solution can be used by employers, for example, for interview screening to test that, that applicants for new roles actually have the skills they claim to have in their resume. And instead of simply asking for a list of buzzwords about technologies, it should now be possible, just as it is very common in the developer community, that an applicant is required to sit down and actually do the job to actually carry out some of the tasks that would be expected of them and prove that they are familiar enough with the environments to be able to do that. Um, the recurring skills assessment is the usage of this scenario to perhaps check people's skills on a recurring basis once they are employed. For example, a second or third tier support team might be required annually to work through some break fix scenarios to ensure that they understand some new technology that the company is now supporting. And, and one last option in this high stakes set would be competitive testing. Uh, and we'll come back and look at that in a little more detail later. Slightly down from that into in terms of the uh, adrenaline level of PBT assessment are what I describe as low stakes scenarios. These are cases which tend to be milestones that a student has reached, testing that the student has actually qualified or completed the work as required. A good example would be a capstone project, the complete development of a project, perhaps at the end of a semester or perhaps at the end of a week's course or training. Uh, another example would be course projects that are assigned during a course, perhaps over a two or three month period. Or indeed in an academic or, or school environment, K-12 environment, simple homework assignments that a teacher could assign to check that students have actually understood the work that was taught in that week. Finally, at the very, what I consider low end, uh, in this case, we have scenarios which are not required uh, in terms of the certification of a student, but can enhance a student and a, an instructor's experience. So the same instrumentation that we use to measure student performance can also be used to measure in roll up the progress of students through a course, the response of students to learning materials, to identify perhaps areas that are not being taught well or understood well, and also to identify areas of technology that are slowing down the students within a course. Students could also use these same levels of solution, the same instrumentation to check their own work. In a self-taught scenario where there is no instructor and no learning partner involved, it's to empower the student to actually check their own work as they go and allow them to identify errors early in a course and not late on in a lab, by which time it's very hard to unwind the problems that they've made. And finally, one of the more exciting concepts that I've been very interested in working on lately is an auto proctor service. The ability to apply AI to the instrumentation we have that's measuring student progress and ho hopefully identify students that might be heading down the wrong path and to intercept that student during their lab and direct them back to the safe path. Well, we don't have time to cover all of those today, but what I do want to do is highlight one from each of these columns. So we're going to take a slightly deeper look at these four cases from these columns. Uh, and I would love to talk about the rest and I happily could talk about this subject all week, but I'm afraid this is probably all that we have time for. So the first scenario I want to cover is an exam prep scenario. This is very similar to a certification exam using PBT in, an, in a lab environment. The particular example I'm pulling up here today is for the VMware VCAP DCV exam and uh, Extreme we offers uh, an exam prep solution for that which uh, students can purchase. Basically, this drops the student into an environment which is very similar to the environment they will encounter in the actual PBT exam. This exam for certification is uh, hosted within the, the same environment, similar environment. And this environment has a number of objectives which is set are set for the student to complete, very similar again to those they will encounter in the actual exam. So the student is provided with this unique environment. They can work through completing the various exercises and objectives. And once they feel they're ready to submit their results, they can launch an assessment tool, which now measures their progress and their completion of each of the tasks that have been assigned. And as you can see here, progressively the tool 
uh, examines the environment, the student work environment, uh, during which time, incidentally, the student is locked out of that environment. They have no mechanism that allows them to interfere with this progress. Note that when something has been incorrectly completed or is incomplete, there is feedback to the student letting them know what they where they went wrong so they have a chance to go back and try this again that's not something they will have obviously in the final exam but in an exam prep scenario it's very helpful to allow them to go back circle back and review their answers to find out where they may have gone wrong and finally once the complete set of objectives have been measured the student will be provided with the final result uh, for their exa exam prep session so this is a tool that provides a good solution uh, for uh, students who are preparing for a PBT based exam environment. And indeed, uh, when Extreme produces PBT solutions, we'd use a very similar process. It's exactly the same level and type of instrumentation behind the scenes. Another example I'm going to pull out from high stakes was the uh, team environment, team competition environment. And uh, we at Extreme have developed a number of these over the years. The example I've called up here is an immersive cyber defense experience. In this scenario, which is quite common at security events or at security training events, uh, attendees are invited into a conference room. They're grouped into teams around a table. Each team is provided with a live environment. It's a simulation of a data center and some end user environments. And then during the session, uh, the environments are then attacked by a series of attack waves, uh, break attempting to break down the servers in the simulated data center and the desktops that users are using. The team's goal is to defend against each of these attacks, to block the attacks from affecting the environment, and all the time ensuring that users on desktops uh, are still able to operate, that none of the user desktops have been impacted by the various attack waves. So it's a competitive environment. You can see that there are scoreboards here. If I move to the next slide, you can see this in more detail. There are leaderboards showing which team is winning at any given time. There's information about which attacks are underway and whether or not uh, users have lost functionality on their desktops, for example. So it's a, a very interesting uh, and high adrenaline environment, uh, one that's been very successful, but it relies on exactly the same PBT infrastructure as we use for certification and exam prep and all of the other high stakes uh, environments. The next scenario that we use PBT for quite heavily is uh, what I would term one of our, our low stakes environments, which is a, a homework assignment that's being scored perhaps for a class. Uh, in this case, the scenario I'm going to show you was a class training in basic Microsoft Azure VM configuration. And the students went through three days of classes uh, learning about the basics of this and then were assigned this particular test to confirm that they had graduated out of that class and could move to the next module in the sequence. And I happen to have uh, this particular session live so we can actually look at what the student experience in this environment actually looks like. So in our environment here, you can see uh, we have a student desktop. Let me show you that desktop here, uh, which they're using to operate with Azure. On our left panel here, we have the instructions, the objectives that have been assigned to the student that they need to complete to successfully pass this test. Uh, within the environment, uh, we are actually working within uh, the portal for Azure. The first objective they were set as part of this test was to create a particular virtual machine with these settings. And just before this session started, I came in here and created that VM. So we were asked to create a, a VM with this name, WServer01, which we have successfully done. It should be running Server 2012 R2. As you can see, that is what it's running. It should be of size standard DS1 V2. And here we have that here. So hopefully we have met all the requirements on this page. The student can then mark that as complete and can then run on to the next option. The next part of this is to set some network uh, firewall settings. We'll do that very quickly. I'm not going to run through all of this, uh, but we will just set this one last thing that, to check that we are allowing HTTPS inbound, inbound from the internet, and we are. We're set to set priority 200. I notice that it's actually set to 300 here, so we'll correct that so that we can pass this piece. 
and here's that setting here. Now, having completed that, I'm not going to run through the rest of this operation, but uh, having completed all of the tasks, I'll leave the rest of them incomplete. Once the student reaches the end of their session and believes that all work has been done, they're offered the option to self-assess, to check their work, basically. They're warned that while we do this, they will have no access to the environment. Students are locked out during any of our scoring processes and have no ability to interfere or monitor or indeed interact with uh, any part of this system. This ensures that we can keep scoring confidential and prevent any interactions there. So while we wait for that to score, what's actually happening behind the scenes is that our scoring platform is injecting the code, running it remotely on this machine. It's actually run from memory. It never exists on disk and therefore cannot be trapped in, for example, a high stakes scenario. Uh, once all of the scenarios that are being checked have been completed, the scores are tabulated and passed back both to the user and also to our database and from there to the content owner, which is a point that we will come on to shortly. Um, I will wait a moment longer for this uh, to finish. The result should be that we provide the status for the student on all five of the scored tasks they were assigned and where they have failed to complete any of those tasks, they will be provided with some comments about what they did wrong or what needs to be corrected in some future attempt at the same exam. Um, the data that we're rolling in there is all rolled up into a database that is accessible to the owner of this content, to the courseware owner and to the exam owner if this is actually a high stakes environment. We offer that option and I think it's a valuable tool for all content owners to be able to monitor the instrumentation on their content so that they can adjust this uh, in future uh, when they find that some items in the content design have not been successfully uh, imparted to the student. Um, and so only by looking at the student's work can they really verify that the training was complete and, and accepted as expected. So scoring has completed for this session. As you can see, we successfully passed the two tasks I attempted to complete and failed on the others. In the cases where we failed, we provided some feedback to the student uh, in indicating what was wrong with their answer in that point. Very good. So let's move briskly forward and just very briefly show you a, a glimpse behind the scenes of what the code looked like that actually did that scoring. It's very simple. Uh, we use PowerShell and that's very common across the board. It's a cross-platform solution and it allows us to easily script these scoring scenarios. Here we see that it took only about 10 lines of which three look like they were formatting uh, to check the work that we just did in creating that VM in Azure. As I alluded to there, and this again, this is now in the low stake, beyond low stakes, but into learning enhancement. The data that's been gathered from any PBT session is incredibly valuable to a course owner. And what we do at Extreme is we roll up reports for a courseware owner in Power BI. And here I've got a, an actual live Power BI report. This one was in fact for uh, an Azure course that ran for a semester, ran for 90 days across a number of modules. and as a, a valuable resource to the owner of the content, uh, this report shows them how that courseware is being used, how the labs are being used, how many users are actually interacting with it. This courseware was self-paced. There were no direct instructors. So this is the only feedback that we can, that is provided and available to the designer of the course to see what the engagement is, uh, how many times the labs were variously launched and, and scored, how much time students were spending, not just within each lab, but also in solving each of the items within that lab and from what countries and so on they were connecting. So a lot of very valuable information. It can of course be filtered. This being Power BI, we can drill through uh, to see uh, subsets of the data as we need it. There are we have multiple time uh, options that we also report against. As you can see, this is the entire semester and not surprisingly, most of the activity seems to have happened towards the end as students rushed to complete their assignments. Uh, the geographic distribution of the data is possibly less useful to the courseware owner. It is high, very useful to ourselves. The graph at the bottom shows uh, usage by hour of day. So for example, uh, you can see here that US users are heavily within Pacific time in the daytime. Um, that helps us in our load balancing behind the scenes. Uh, 
And finally, looking at the actual scoring and the PBT elements, uh, we can roll up all of the PBT results for specific scenarios, uh, allowing the courseware creator to see what the mix of hard and easy questions are. All good exams and all good courses should have questions that are mostly answered correctly, as we see here, and harder questions where most people fail and only the best students pass. And so at a glance, uh, this can be validated and monitored over time. Um, there is one other aspect to this that I think is very important for courseware owners, and we automate some of this process. This graph represents one specific task within one specific lab, and it looks over time at the pass fail rates. It's most useful to look at this at the bottom where we're looking at percentage pass fail. And as you can see, over the duration of the semester, uh, the pass and fail rates per day were uh, variable, but uh, at a similar sort of average at all times until we reach day 71 and on from day 71 onwards all students in this course failed this particular question now that triggers for us an alarm we have a system that's looking out for this scenario because it generally means there's a break in the system and sure enough when we investigated this one we discovered that the specific azure feature that was being talked here had been deprecated overnight between day 70 and 71 and so monitoring this level of instrumentation as part of a pbt is a good way to ensure that the courseware remains accurate and valid and is still uh, effective in all of the elements that are being taught so it provides a good alarm for that process Right, so that's really all I wanted to cover for us today. Um, we've looked at all of the various scenarios here that, uh, that I believe are easily attainable through PBT and the PBT instrumentation of hands-on labs. I think it's a very rich set. There are many more ways to leverage this uh, technology than I show here, but these are certainly ones that we've found most common and the ones that we've provided for our clients more, more, more often. Uh, I hope you found this interesting and uh, that you may have an interest and see the value that PBT could bring to training scenarios in the future going forward. And so uh, at that point, I think I'll wind this up and say thank you very much.